Mother's Day. I'm not sure why I selected this particular topic, other than I mentioned to you I was going to talk to the men. I changed my mind on that as well. <laughs> I want to talk about positive family living, which includes all of us, okay? And of course, uh, being Mother's Day, it's a day uh, to honor those who courageously and tirelessly shape a better life for our children. And it's no secret that moms face many challenges today. But the, they deserve an, our utmost love and respect. And uh, if, if, you are, um, if you have a mother today, and I know all of you do, uh, at least last I checked, biologically, we all have mothers. I want us to pray, to start off our time together praying for all the mothers. And I'd like for you to join me. All right, let's pray. God in heaven, this is a special day because it is a day that we honor and respect our mothers. We reflect upon the memories. Some father here today have mothers who are still living, others who are not, and yet the legacy of our mothers continues on. And then, Father, I, I realize that we have mothers here today who are happy. I realize that there are some who are sad, who are worried and who might be heartbroken. I pray for them. I pray, Father, for your blessing on all of those who have invested life and time and treasure to the development of family. And Lord, we praise you and we honor you for their lives and the testimony of their lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our families seem to be in a state of turmoil and busyness and at times crisis and maybe even tragedy. We, we, we wish we could put a shield up around us so that nothing would attack us, our nice little families. But it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. There are difficulties uh, that are lurking around every corner. And sometimes there's no escaping the inevitable. I mean, today is Mother's Day, and I know many of you are maybe not that excited about today. You've maybe in the past have been brokenhearted because of what your children have done or haven't done, or you've been through some tragedy as a mother that has brought despair or grief and disappointment. But don't get me wrong, it is a time of celebration, and yet there are many things that dull that celebration, and it, ha it happens in life that we sometimes find ourselves experiencing where the Apple cart is tipped over, and our wonderful expectations just aren't what they need to be. Pressures from the outside kind of bear down upon us, and our families seem to crumble under that pressure. We as Christian families, though, are called to endure no matter what the winds of life blow our way. Here's a verse of scripture that I know you're very familiar with, found in James, where James says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, notice, produces endurance, or steadfastness, or perseverance. What's interesting in the background of this is that James is talking to a people who have been scattered as a part of persecution for their faith. 
So what I highlight today is that these same trials are pressures that come to our families today and should not destroy us, but build us up and make us stronger witnesses and representatives of Jesus Christ. Now, we journey up many uh, steep, rocky paths, but when we reach the top, we're always better for it. And I call us today as Christian families to endure, to stay strong even when the battles heat up or the last straw seems to be placed on the camel's back. Because endurance produces stronger families and brighter lights for the God of hope. Now, as I was thinking through this this topic of enduring as families and experiencing positive family living, I thought of my experiences as a camper with a tent. What an awful, awful experience. <laughs> and Judy, <laughs> Judy and I, we um, started with tents, and um, that was okay for a while. We went to this little camper that we have now, which is great. And last summer, we experienced the worst storm we've ever experienced camping. And... We're in this little bitty camper, and we're in eastern Ohio, and tornadoes are going through, and we're sitting in this camper about 2 o'clock in the morning, I don't remember, 4 o'clock in the morning, whatever. We're sitting looking at each other on on the other ends of the camper, and guess what that camper's doing? It's just going like this. I mean, I'm going, what's going to keep this camper to the ground? I don't know. But then I think about tents. Well, that's even worse. And so when we are thinking about tents and camping, I want to be sure the stakes in the four corners of that tent are pretty secure so that when the winds of life blow and brew and come upon us, those tent stakes are going to be secure and firmly grounded. And I think about life in the same way, and I think about our families in the same way. I I think about what it is that's going to securely keep us firm in our faith and in our purpose as families. And I've come up with four stakes that need to be firmly grounded, firmly placed so that our tents of life stay strong. And, you know, there are many different types of winds that our families are going to face. Some are controllable. We can control some of the winds of life, like maybe financial decisions or scheduling decisions or relationship decisions. Those are all things we have some type of control over. But then there are other winds of life that face our families where we have no control, like disease and sickness and death and accidents. Those things we have no control over. And we want to be sure that our tents are securely placed, the stakes are firmly placed in the ground so that when these winds come, that we we will stand firm. So let's talk about the stakes that we need that have to be driven firmly into the ground for our families to to survive, the winds of disaster. The first one is a Christ-centered home. I'm not telling you anything new here. If we're going to have that first stake in the ground, it's got to be that we're all about Jesus, that he is firmly in our minds, and it all starts with him. And he is at the center of our family. So this means mom and dad need to be totally committed to Jesus. The Hebrew writer says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Uh, That's something we have to strive for every day. That's 
That's the priority that we need to have is that Jesus is at the center. He's the one that we put in place and we live around him and what he wants. And this is where I think our personal stories, our spiritual journeys need to come into play. Especially if we want to have that positive family living to take place and we want to develop um, where our, our families and our children grow up to con continue the legacy that we've started, I think we need to share our spiritual stories and our spiritual journey with our children. They need to hear how you came to Christ. They need to hear about the influences that brought you to where you're at today. And they need to know the difference right now that Jesus makes in your life. Now, in my case, my children have children, which means I have grandchildren, okay? And I have 10 of them. And I take the opportunity every time I can when I am alone with one of them to be sure they hear about my story. Whether they're swinging on the swing or even we're throwing football, which I did yesterday, and my arm just hurts like crazy. But I, I want them to be sure they hear my story, my spiritual story. How I grew up in a Christian home, which is good. I became a minister, that's good. How I'm living my life for Jesus the best I can, that's good. I want them to know that. They need to hear about that story, and I try to make them aware of it as much as I can. They need to see how vulnerable we are and how strong Jesus is. The second, and if you're following in your bulletin, I switched things up a little bit, and I took the fourth point, and I'm moving it to the second point. Have I confused you? So if you're following your bulletin, it's a little bit in a different order. But the second stake that I want to talk about is a commitment to one another. We need to have a Christ-centered Christ home, but we need to be sure that we have a commitment to one another that's strong. A commitment is what drives those stakes further into the ground. Commitment says, we're going to see this thing through. And I'm talking whether it's husband, wife, uh, mother, daughter, uh, dad, son, whatever that might be, we're going to see this thing through. We don't run out on each other when the going gets tough and when the last straw seems to be, have been placed on the camel's back, we hold on, we stick together. Now the lie we sometimes believe is that it's easier to bail out than to face the problems head on. But not in God's eyes. He wants unity in his households because that speaks volumes to a world that really needs to see that. He wants that unity in his household. And this is where, of course, the husband and wife relationship needs to be strong and committed and solid. And in many situations, this, this is really the only stability our children might see or have. They see mom and dad loving one another. So that's the other stake. Those are two stakes that are very important a Christ-centered home, and a commitment to one another. And then there's the third stake, and that is a genuine trust in God. A genuine trust in God. Now, the, the next two stakes for me go hand in hand. We, we don't have all of the answers to why things happen the way they do. We have really no control over the prevention or results of certain situations in life. But we can only trust in the Lord with all of our heart. You remember where that's found? Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your way what? 
straight. So we trust in the Lord. It's that genuine trust in God, which is that third stake that's so important to have a positive family life. God will never, listen to me, God will never make a wrong choice or make a bad decision. You've got to believe that. He will never make a wrong choice or make a bad decision. He is the righteous one. He's the perfect one. He's the good one. Romans 8 says, and we know that in all things God works together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So my trust in God uh, brings about that opportunity for me to share with other people how God works in my life and in my family. Now, a part of the genuine trust in God is prayer. I, I want to take just a few minutes to talk about the role of prayer in our families. I believe it's a part of genuinely trusting God is in prayer and how we pray, communicating to God, trusting Him. That's why we pray. We know that He is the resource. He's the one who's going to answer, and He's the one who's going to make our path straight, and He hears us, and so we bring everything to, at His feet. So what would be some things that you and I, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, what could we be praying about for our children? Let me just suggest three real quick. First, to pray for the salvation of your children or grandchildren. To pray for the salvation of your children or grandchildren. Don't just leave it up to somebody else. It is never too soon to start praying for their, their salvation. And I know that some of you are still praying for your children's souls. And it's been a long time. But I encourage you to stick with it, to continue to pray because God hears. One of my commitments when I started to have grandchildren was um, to commit my grandchildren to the Lord. And so um, my first grandson, Christian, it was in this very church building here when the Sunday after he was born, I had opportunity to hold him. And uh, I dedicated him to the Lord. And ever since, Judy and I, we've been praying for our grandchildren to be sure that they come to him and receive that salvation. That is so important. Uh, but I also think we need to pray that our children would be a credit to the kingdom, that they would develop a, a godly character so one of the things you can do is you can ask God to protect them from the evil one, that they turn their face toward God and his righteousness. You know, I think of the Old Testament, and uh, probably many sermons today are being preached on the topic of Hannah in the Old Testament when she had Samuel, her son. But Hannah is a good example of a mother who helped make her son a credit to God's kingdom through prayer. I mean, painful years of waiting to conceive a child had already taken their toll when we first read about Hannah in 1 Samuel. She wept and she prayed because of her barrenness. Her husband loved her but could not alleviate the anguish that she experienced. And Hannah promised that if God would give her a son, she would give him to God for all of his life. So God heard her cry. He understood how she was suffering and answered Hannah's prayer by giving her a fine baby boy. And she never forgot that her son Samuel was the answer to prayer. And she gave him a name that would remind her that it was God's will for her and God's gift to her. So Samuel, which means I asked the Lord for him. That's what it means. And Hannah turned him over to Levi in the temple, and she continued to pray for his growth and maturity. And we all know the role of Samuel in anointing David the king. So God used Hannah and her prayer to bring about a mighty man 
a mighty prophet in, in, in the, the scope of God's plan. But there's a third thing I think we need to pray about, and then we need to pray that uh, our children would be used to promote the kingdom of God. Um, not only to be a credit to the kingdom, but to promote the kingdom of God. And God has entrusted the advancement of his kingdom to men and women when he calls them. And God looks for those who care about his concerns, about his honor, and the advancement of his kingdom. We need to pray more for harvest workers. We need to see that our children answer the call of God to be used by him in whatever capacity that might be. I mean, of course, I work for Great Lakes Christian College, so you know what my appeal is. We need more preachers, and we need more youth ministers. We need more missionaries. We need more servants of the Lord, not only in the church, but also in the world. Let's pray that our children would be used by God to promote the kingdom of God. A genuine trust in God where we're praying and bringing to the throne of God um, our children and our grandchildren. But then there's that fourth tent, stake, or peg that's really important, and that is a godly perspective, a godly perspective. Now, half of our problems come when... Um, half of our problems... Uh, come when we try to cope on our own. And we face different things in life and with our families, and we lose perspective. We do not see it the way God sees it. We become disappointed because it's not going our way. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when we talk about a godly perspective, we, we need to continue to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and the big picture. So, for example, how do we view suffering? How do we react when things don't go our way? I can tell you how the world reacts. The world denies it. The world blames God. The world panics. And the world becomes bitter and angry. But that's not what God calls us to. The Christian, though, should keep depending on God, maybe correct the way we do things, or even create a sympathetic spirit. Now, I know that many of you, and I want to direct my thoughts here to a very, um, to a, a real concern that's going on. Many of you know Jordan and Sammy Joe Sovis. And you have been praying for them and their little guy, Coleman. And you're familiar with what's going on, maybe through Facebook, and they give a report on how he's doing, and he's not doing well. And he's struggling for life without an immune system. And you know, if they could just get him over the viruses and all that's happening, he would be able to have a bone marrow transplant. And I'm bringing this up because the testimony of this young couple, I hope I can do this, but I think I need to. The testimony of this young couple just blows me away. They're trusting God. Their godly perspective should encourage us all forward and give us an example to follow when we face trials in our own homes, which I don't think it's all relative, right? 
I mean, they're going through this suffering and issues, and, 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 and we have our own issues and things that we face. But God is calling us to a higher standard to have a perspective that keeps the big picture in mind when it comes to where we're at as Christian people. Um, if you've been following it at all, here are some of the comments that have been made. Jordan, he says, Sam and I are standing firm and declaring life and love to Coleman. Yahweh gives life and life abundantly. He created Coleman. We know his will is for Coleman to live. And then um, Sammy Jo, she, she made the, these comments and statements. And I want you to hear what she says because this is the godly perspective that we are to have. She goes, I was sad. I allowed myself to feel sad, but without losing faith or hope, I'm mostly sad for everything his little body is enduring. And I'm sad for how much I miss him and how much how he must also feel the same way. I also felt angry that we have to go through this. I know many will say that these are legitimate feelings of grief, but I know that feelings of anger are dangerous as they can lead to blame and shame and bitterness. I had to be intentional to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. For example, I felt angry with myself for not catching this sooner and taking him into the hospital sooner? Would that have lessened the severity? Any of those what-if questions that arise, I have to stop myself. This isn't anyone's fault other than the evil ones. By taking that thought captive and obedient to Christ, I instead say, listen, thank you, Lord, that you helped me notice this that you led us to the hospital at just the right time, and that you're walking us through this. We have to stay submitted to the Lord in our circumstances by keeping our eyes on him. And it has to be intentional because it's so easy to get swept away by our circumstances. And then I think many of you know that Sammy Joe is a horse trainer. And immediately her thoughts went to that background, which I, I just see so interesting. And she says, as a horse trainer, I think of how horses react when pressure is put on them. A good horse will submit to the pressure and yield to the trainer. An untrained horse will submit to their natural flight or fight response and will try to run away or, or fight back. The more of a good relationship with the trainer that they have, the more they trust and submit. Putting myself in that position, I am thankful to have the one perfect trainer, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit. And today, being in a better mindset and having processed my feelings from yesterday, my thoughts are more concerned for how I can live in this circumstance to bring God the most glory. There it is. Yep. Now, I think it's clear that in the life of this young couple who bears the burden of seeing their child suffer, they have a trust in the Lord and a godly perspective that is strong and maybe more obvious than many of us can handle. It hurts. Every time I read one of their posts, and of course, I even in my inadequacy say, you know, it's not fair. But life is not fair. But God is. God has all the answers. That's where I put my trust. So when I have these winds of life that just blow upon us as in our families, we need to be sure these, stents, these stakes are firmly planted in the ground. That I have this perspective. And this I know, whatever the outcome for the Sovises, God will be seen through it all. Their family will be a city 
that's set on a hill. And they will be the shining light for all to see. That's what godly, trusting families look like in a dark world of skepticism, of hurt, of bitterness. You know, you've probably been in an arena where people take out their phones, they turn out the lights, they take out their phones, they turn their lights on, and everybody kind of waves their phone. That's what I see families, Christian families, being those shining lights in a dark statement, in a dark world. Because we've trusted God, we've got his perspective, we've made a commitment, and we put him at the center of our lives. I, I wish I could wave a magic wand. You know, that's the grandpa in me. I wish I could wave a magic wand so that all of our difficulties and all of our problems would just go away. But I can't do that. But I can direct you to the one who said, Come unto me, all of you, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Jesus saying that. So an enduring family is a shining light to a dark world. So I ask you to commit yourself to a Christ-centered home and to one another. I ask you to trust God with your whole heart and maintain a godly perspective where God is honored and God is glorified and will be those shining lights in a dark world. We're going to do something a little different for our next steps, and I'm going to ask Judy if she'll come up in the band to come on up. Our next steps today is going to be silent prayer. And what I'd like you to do in this silent prayer is, uh, I've, I've talked about a lot of things. This was a topical sermon that brought up a lot of topics. And there might have been something for you or something that God has brought to your mind about this. Maybe, maybe you need to put Jesus first in your life. Uh, maybe your, your perspective isn't where it needs to be. Or maybe you need to give your life to Jesus or trust him wholeheartedly, whatever that might be. In our silent prayer, as Judy's playing, I just want you to allow God to bring to mind something in your life right now that needs to be acted upon. It might be a relationship. It might be giving your life to Jesus. It might be seeking out his will. It might be readjusting your perspective, whatever it might be. Just allow God to do that and then to pray that he would lead you in that to make a difference. If you need to give your life to Jesus, that's the most important thing. And I know Matt's going to be in the back and I'll be up here in the front. And if you want to talk or pray, I'm more than willing to do that. So let's just take some silent prayer at this point in time. Allow God to bring to mind what it is that you need to act upon.